so Steve, I think you can go ahead and start. We have people still trickling in, but I think you're okay. Okay, yeah, yeah. Well, welcome everyone to um, another in the Vermont uh, Center on Behavior and Health lecture series. Um, we're really fortunate today. We have Dr. Sudi Back, who is um, going to lecture on integrated exposure-based treatment of co-occurring PTSD and substance use disorders something certainly that those of us working in, in this area know is, is a hugely important topic, uh, something we see every day. Um, so in our group, uh, Dr. Kelly Peck's research is closest to Sudi. So I'm, I've asked uh, Kelly if he would provide an introduction. Kelly? Hey, Steve. Um, today, it's, um, I'm honored to introduce Dr. Sudi Back. Uh, Dr. Back received her PhD in clinical psychology from the University of Georgia in 2004. She completed her clinical internship training with a specialization in the treatment of substance use disorders at Yale University School of Medicine, and then she completed her postdoctoral training at the Medical University of South Carolina in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences. Um, she joined the MUSC faculty in 2005, and she's currently a professor and director of the NIH-sponsored drug abuse um, research training programs at MUSC. Dr. Back is also a staff psychologist at the Ralph H. Johnson VA in the substance treatment recovery, substance treatment and recovery program. Um, I've personally followed Dr. Back's um, work over the past 10 years or so, as her primary research interests focus on um, the treatment of substance use disorders and co-occurring conditions such as post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, she has quite literally written the book on the treatment of concurrent, um, on the concurrent treatment of PTSD and substance use disorders. I have a manual sitting on my desk, I promise this isn't planned. Um, and by my count, she has 135 peer-reviewed publications um, although I'm most familiar with her work involving prolonged exposure therapy uh, for concurrent PTSD and substance use disorders, her work spans a broad range of both psychosocial and pharmacological interventions for co-occurring conditions. Um, some of her more recent pharmacologic uh, treatment trials have examined the efficacy of oxytocin in combination with prolonged exposure therapy uh, for the treatment of PTSD, as well as, let's see if I can say this right, in acetylcysteine for the treatment of alcohol use disorder and PTSD. And I'm, on, I'm off to a good start. Um, and just to top it all off, Dr. Back also has an impressive track record of laboratory-based and neuroimaging studies examining the association between substance use and stress response. Um, Dr. Back also has an impressive track record of obtaining research funding from the NIH, the Department of Defense, and the VA. In 2007, she received the K-23 Career Development Award, and over the past two years, again, or past 10 years by my count, she's been the primary investigator on four different R01s. In addition, she's been the recipient of the K02, of a K-02 Independent Scientist Award and the Fulbright Scholar Award. Her reputation as a mentor precedes her as she's actively engaged in mentoring um, pre-doc, post-doc, and junior investigators at MUSC and has played no small role um, in establ establishing MUSC as a world-renowned training site um, for co-occurring conditions. So that's enough of me talking. Please join me today in welcoming Dr. Bag virtually uh, to the Vermont Center on Behavior and Health lecture series. I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Bag. Thank you so much. That was probably the loveliest introduction and most generous in introduction I've ever uh, received. So thank you. I really appreciate um, the opportunity to be a part of the, uh, the lecture series today and um, looking forward to talking with others after the lecture today as well. So I'm gonna be talking about um, the integrated exposure-based treatment of co-occurring PTSD and substance use disorders. Today. And I have a number of individuals to, uh, to give thanks to and to acknowledge their huge contributions to the work that I'm gonna be presenting and talking about. And these are some of the key 
uh, individuals here. I'll describe some of their um, contributions and collaborations uh, in the presentation. And for disclosures, the, uh, the Coke therapy is one that I'll be talking about today. Um, it's been sponsored by NIDA and NIAAA, thankfully. And um, the manuals are published through Oxford University Press. So as an outline today, um, I wanted to give a brief background of um, the overview of PTSD. I wasn't sure how familiar how much this group works with PTSD, so I'll just run briefly through some of the basics, talk about the interrelationship between PTSD and SUD. And then in part two, I'll spend a little time talking about the COPE intervention specifically, some of the research to date and the clinical components. And then in section three, talk about some ongoing uh, studies that we have and future directions. And those will involve some augmentation strategies that I'll talk about primarily pharmacotherapy and also technology enhancements. So with PTSD, many of you I'm sure are familiar with PTSD, uh, first introduced into the DSM nomenclature in 1980, um, chronic and debilitating disorder that can occur in individuals after they experience a criterion or event. Uh, and we work with individuals who have a variety of different types of, of traumas. Most of them will have multiple um, trauma experiences and experiences with multiple different types of trauma as well. The criteria for PTSD, uh, the first is that exposure to the Criterion 8 event. Um, and then symptoms that are characteristic of the disorder are the experiencing symptoms, so intrusive memories, nightmares, flashbacks, for example. Avoidance is a big one. So avoidance of trauma-related stimuli in the environment, certain places or activities, thoughts or feelings. Negative alterations in thoughts um, and mood as well. And then marked alterations in arousal and reactivity. So it's hypervigilance, um, irritable behavior, sleeping disturbances, and self destructive behaviors. The duration has to last for at least one month and has significant distress and pain. Sudi, I don't mean to interrupt you, but we are getting a little bit of static from your mic and it's cutting out. A little bit, um, so I'm not okay. sure if it just is a, a plug-in issue. Um, All right. But I just wanted to let you. Know. If I take them off, hear that okay? I still hear it a little bit. Um, I think we can. You might just need to be. It, it may be better. Um, I think we can try and see. Okay, I would try without. Yeah, I would try maybe try without. Alrighty. Sorry about that. Okay. Okay. How about if we try that? Uh, let's let's try. Let's go ahead and try and see if that makes it better. Okay. All right. Let me know. Okay. So, how common is PTSD? Um, most individuals in the United States, seventy percent or more, have experienced some type of traumatic event, um, at least once in their life. And up to 20% of those people will go on to develop PTSD. It's estimated that at any given time, 8% uh, percent of Americans um, have PTSD, and that's about equal to the total population of the state of Texas. And an estimated one out of every nine women develops PTSD, uh, which is twice as high as men. So PTSD among military veterans seeking treatment at the VA hospitals is the most common mental health disorder. And the prevalence ranges based on the sample um, and the theater that they uh, served in, but up to 30% or so lifetime prevalence. Is the audio okay, Nicole? Yes, we're all set. Sounds good. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, so in terms of the comorbidity, individuals with PTSD are two to five times more likely to have a co-occurring substance use disorder than those without PTSD. And um, many or most, many of the individuals that we see with co-occurring PTSD and SUD report early childhood traumas, such as childhood physical or sexual abuse. Um, multiple traumas, as I mentioned before, are really the norm. And as debilitating as we know PTSD is, its clinical course and outcomes are worsened by the co-occurrence of a substance use disorder. 
and that translates into poor physical health, treatment responses, more inpatient hospitalizations, more interpersonal problems, legal problems, as well as higher rates of suicide uh, attempts and suicidal ideation. And I wanted to mention um, the unique relationship here between PTSD and opioids, uh, which I know um, Dr. Peck is looking at and, and maybe others in the group too. So um, one of our ongoing you know, pandemics, uh, epidemics, is the opioid use disorder epidemic um, in the United States. And um, prescription opioids are one of the most commonly used drugs, second only to marijuana. Uh, very high rates of trauma and also high rates of PTSD have been shown among patients with opioid use disorder. And some of the work among um, military veterans, um, one study found that service members with opioid use disorder were 28 times more likely to have PTSD than those without. Um, most individuals also do not receive evidence-based care for PTSD. Um, only about 12% in one of the, the research articles. So integrated um, evidence-based treatment can help improve both retention um, in medication-assisted treatment, MAT, as well as overall outcomes. We've asked, um, we've asked patients, uh, in this case veterans, about the interrelationship and their, their beliefs around it. And so when we've asked veterans, do you believe that your substance use and PTSD symptoms are related? Um, as you can see here, almost all of them said yes, that they are related. And then when we've asked them, if your PTSD symptoms get worse, what happens to your substance use? And 85% reported that if their substance use got worse, um, I'm sorry, if their PTSD symptoms got worse, their substance use also got worse. So there's about 10% saying it stayed the same. So there's that connection that is, um, is, is recognized by many um, patients as well. One of the problems to date has been that um, the majority of clinical trials for PTSD have typically excluded individuals with substance use disorder comorbidity. So in 2017, there was a paper by Lehman and colleagues um, that looked at 156 different randomized controlled trials and found that 74% um, were excluding participants based on their substance use status. Um, only 8% uh, of studies examined substance use outcomes in those studies, but importantly, none of the studies observed an increase in substance use during PTSD treatment. Um, however, the research you know, is limited um, in this way, the research literature. So how is co-occurring PTSD and SUD uh, treated, you know, given, given these limitations in the current literature? Historically, the sequential treatment approach has been the main, sometimes the only uh, option. And so in the sequential treatment approach, um, individuals complete their SUD, um, treatment first and really only focus on the addiction piece. Oftentimes they're you know, required to um, uh, attain and maintain abstinence for some period of time. Then uh, and only then are they referred to uh, trauma treatment for PTSD. And there are some limitations um, with this approach, mainly that it's siloed, um, inefficient, there's little crossover provider communication mostly um, between the SUD treatment providers and the PTSD treatment providers. Um, and there could be a greater burden on patients because they have, you know, it takes more time to complete all, all of the treatments, um, more cost, multiple providers can be, can be difficult to, to manage for patients. Um, but it, it speaks to some of the common myths um, in the field of co-occurring PTSD and SUD um, that still remain, you know, um, not as common, but, but somewhat so. Uh, and those, you know, common myths are that talking about the trauma, about what happened will make patients relapse or use more, or that you can't start trauma work until a patient uh, is clean uh, and sober, or that abstinence is the only option. So there's you know, there, there is empirical evidence that disconfirms these myths, and even more and more um, growing in the literature, but um, none supported by research, none of the myths supported by research. 
So integrated psychotherapy um, is uh, something that our team has been working on um, for 10, 20 years now. And um, I'll talk a little bit about that uh, moving forward. So integrated psychotherapy is different from sequential. So integrated is it's a behavioral intervention or talk therapy that integrates treatment, evidence-based treatment for both the PTSD and the substance use disorder conducted by one clinician um, who works with a patient in one treatment episode on both of those conditions. And it's different from parallel treatment where you have two different providers who are each providing single focus care or the sequential that I mentioned earlier. So reasons to consider integrated psychotherapy um, would be that untreated PTSD is a risk factor for relapse and use. We have a number of individuals who um, in line with the self-medication hypothesis you know, indicate that they use alcohol or drugs in order to try to mitigate some of the PTSD symptoms, some of the distressing memories, um, of sleep, uh, use it to be able to not avoid some of the things that they're avoiding. Um, it's also a more efficient use of time and resources and you can treat both of them together instead of two different treatment episodes. It helps reduce the potential that patients will fall through the cracks, that maybe they'll go to SUD addiction treatment and do well there um, or not, but maybe they won't follow up with you know, PTSD treatment the next steps. And there's research showing that reductions in PTSD symptoms are more likely to lead to reductions in substance use uh, symptoms than the reverse. Patients recognize the symptom connection and many prefer integrated treatment. Um, and also integrated psychotherapy has been recommended by the VA and the DOD and other clinical practice guidelines. So the integrated PTSD SUD care model that we've been working by is that um, if you treat the PTSD and the addiction together, you can help the patient learn to manage their PTSD symptoms without substances and experience recovery from both conditions, producing long-term relief. So the COVE integrated psychotherapy is the primary one that we've been working on. Um, it is a 12-session evidence-based uh, CBT. Sessions are 90 minutes, delivered once a week, um, individual format. And it synthesizes two evidence-based treatments, prolonged exposure uh, for PTSD and um, cognitive behavioral techniques for SUD. And so we worked uh, together with Emma Foa um, and Kathy Carroll on these two components to integrate them. And so the primary goals of the treatment are to provide psychoeducation, decrease PTSD symptoms by a PE from exposure, and decrease substance use when using CBT techniques. And so here's some of the wonderful collaborators that I've had the chance to, to work with um, over the years. Um, most, mostly at, at NUSC, there's Kathleen Brady, Therese Colleen, and Julian Flanagan, uh, and then some other lovely collaborators um, in Australia and also in Sweden. And um, these are the COVE studies to date. And we have two um, that are currently ongoing. So the first study was um, published in 2001, so 20 years ago, uh, by Kathleen Brady. It was the very first open label. We called it like a pre COVE uh, because we did make some pretty major modifications to the intervention after that. Um, and I was, I was one of the study therapists um, on that trial um, 20 years ago. So I've been able to be involved in um, many, if not all of these projects over the years. Um, and we have, again, those two ongoing that I will talk to you about a little bit later. Um, we have one study um, that I'm collaborating with in Australia where we've modified code for adolescents because we do see that so many of the adults that come to us for treatment have early life traumas and we wanted to start earlier if we could. And then uh, Julian Flanagan and I um, have a, a newer study to look at COPE combined with oxytocin. So that initial proof of concept study I mentioned it was led by Dr. Kathleen Brady. It was among um, a small sample of individuals with cocaine uh, dependence and PTSD, mostly women. Um, the majority reporting great 
uh, as well as physical assault. And we, we looked at, um, on the side, uh, right side, you can see we looked at the positive UDS test as well um, and found that there were about 13% positive match treatment in entry. And um, that went down over time. And we also found here the, the IES, um, which is uh, impact of event scales, that maybe is widely used now, but was used a lot. And the CAPS, which I'm sure folks are familiar with, Commission Administered PTSD scale, the Mississippi, also another um, self report PTSD scale, and the Addiction Severity Index. This was the very first time that um, anyone had, uh, had really looked at um, trauma focused, especially exposure based treatment. Um, in a co occurring group. And so you know, the goal here was to, to demonstrate safety, feasibility, acceptability. And then the first randomized controlled trial took place in Australia. Um, uh, and just some characteristics of that sample there were 103, so much larger sample size, individuals in the community. Um, as noted on this left column at the top, um, the age of their first trauma was eight years old, and 77% uh, had childhood traumas before 15. Um, a little over a third had had prior PTSD treatment, and the number of different types of traumas from eight to six. Um, their baseline caps, this was an uh, earlier caps version, uh, was a 90, which was severe PTSD. And you can see the multiple types of traumas that they've experienced. Um, uh, under the trauma types there. For the substance use characteristics on the right side, 80% um, had a history of um, injection drug use and 93% had had prior SUD treatment. So it's interesting also to note how many had prior addiction treatment, but not PTSD or trauma treatment. And they were also a, a poly substance using group um, with uh, a lot of different types of substances used in the past month. In terms of their substance of concern, um, most common were heroin, cannabis, and amphetamines. And they compared quote to treatment as usual. Treatment as usual was in the community, uh, mostly for um, addiction treatment, and found that substance use decreased um, comparably. So with doing the exposure-based treatment, um, Patients did not get worse, did not use more. Their, their substance use went down over time. Um, and that uh, COPE plus the treatment as usual resulted in significantly lower caps uh, or PTSD symptoms as well compared to treatment as usual. And some of the quotes were really nice um, from the patients who participated. And we hear these you know, resonated in, in things that patients state as today, similar ways, you know, that Overall, I thought it was great. No one had ever talked to me about, about my trauma before. It was good to put a name to my symptoms. Um, we found that a lot of people, um, maybe even more so than some of our veterans, had not talked about or spoken about or shared um, what their experiences were. Um, and that can you know, be very impactful. Um, so the person said it changed their life. It was hard going through it, but since doing it made a lot of positive changes, doing the imaginal exposure really took the fear away. I didn't even realize PTSD treatment was available, and now I can talk about the incident without freaking out. The imagined exposure was the hardest part, but also the most useful. And I'll tell you a little bit more about some of the components as we move along today. So more recently, uh, my colleagues, uh, Lucia Rubas and Denise Yen um, in New York, conducted a study um, of community um, individuals, 110 individuals, and they looked at hope in either full or sub-threshold PTSD. Um, average age was 45, 59% African-American, 19% Hispanic. And they presented um, more than half at physical assault and 29% um, sexual assault. Their primary substances were varied. So alcohol, cocaine, you know, the main ones there, as well as alcohol plus stimulants. So they compared COPE versus RP, relapse prevention, um, versus an active monitoring control group, and found that among those with full PTSD, COPE had significantly greater decreases in PTSD severity compared to relapse prevention. It was not significant among those with sub-threshold 
So that helps to inform who we think would be uh, the best candidates um, who, who might see the most benefit from doing um, a treatment like hope. There were significant reductions in substance use in both uh, treatment groups, favoring the RP uh, slightly better. So um, in the treatment abstinence is 13% and than 14% in relapse prevention, um, which is low. It's, it was a tough uh, real world population, uh, but substance use did not increase with exposure work again, showing that it is feasible, it is safe, and no differences in the number of retention either. Although the number of retention was lower, six and seven out of 12. So ways to improve and enhance um, retention allowing people to get the, the full benefit from this and many of our treatments um, would be really helpful. Uh, we conducted then um, a relapse, based, sorry, uh, RCT in military veterans for the first military group, um, 81 uh, veterans, 90% male. Their average age was about 40, 37% um, African American, 4% Hispanic, and 81% of them had a military related index trauma. Um, almost 70% had physical assault and about 25% had sexual trauma. Um, mostly, uh, the vast majority had alcohol use disorder. And then 27% also had a drug use disorder. And about 10% of this had drug use disorder only. They had severe caps at baseline as well. And um, lifetime suicidal ideation was 42%. Lifetime attempts was 27% for the same time. And we worked with Crystal Bay Dorr, who's at the University of Kentucky. Um, she was here at NUSC for her uh, pre and some of her postdoctoral training. Um, and we continue to collaborate. And so she conducted the analyses and found that COPE resulted in significantly lower CATS and PCL, the uh, PTSD checklist self-report measure of PTSD symptoms, and that there were higher rates of diagnostic remission in COPE um, as compared to relapse prevention as well. And for substance use, we found that those reduced um, significantly and comparably, about 41% in COVID and 26% uh, in relapse prevention were abstinent um, during the last two weeks of treatment. And then at follow-up, at six months follow-up, we found some uh, signs of greater reduction in COVID. But overall, I would say it, it was comparable. And the therapeutic alliance in both groups was strong um, and not significantly different. Retention was also um, not significantly different. Hope was nine sessions and RP was seven. And the majority of, of both um, of the conditions were covered. Majority of the COPE sessions and RP sessions. And then Crystal also looked at um, mechanisms of change. And so, uh, she looked at habituation of the stress as well as craving. So habituation of fear, which is measured by subjective units of distress of sides within session and between sessions has been studied um, in the PE literature, uh, mostly among PTSD only patients. And the research shows that it's the between session habituation and not the within session habituation that really predicts PTSD symptom improvement. And so the key findings here, which is one of the first studies to look at um, within and between subject, or sorry, within and between session habituation to distress and craving within a co-occurring sample. Um, she found that the between session distress habituation was associated with greater reduction in PTSD symptoms, um, confirming what we find in the PE um, PTSD only sample literature, and that between session craving habituation was also associated with improvement in PTSD symptoms. Between subject, sorry, between session craving habituation was also associated with greater decreases in substance use. So that was an you know, interesting finding and helps to, um, you know, it speaks to the importance of, of helping patients habituate both their PTSD and craving over time um, could be particularly beneficial for this population. Sonia Norman um, uh, more recently conducted a study among veterans with 119 veterans, 42 years old, 90% male, 13% um, African-American, 29% Hispanic, 
average number of traumas eight different types of traumas. And 84% um, have combat trauma. And she compared COPE to um, an intervention, integrated intervention called Seeking Safety. Um, seeking Safety is, is a coping skills, present-based therapy. So there's no exposure or you know, direct focus on the traumatic um, experience, but more of a focus on current symptoms. And it's typically 25 sessions in week, um, but 12 sessions is used for both treatments here. <clears throat> And um, they found significantly greater reduction in PTSD symptoms in COPE than seeking safety, um, higher rates of PTSD remission as well in COPE. Comparable days of abstinence, they had really nice abstinence levels, 68% um, in COPE and 63% in seeking safety. Overall, 10 out of 12 sessions were attended, so also good attendance, um, but fewer sessions attended in COPE than in seeking safety. And then more recently, um, other colleagues have looked at reduction in trauma-related guilt and secondary symptoms and found greater reduction in, um, in the COVID and seeking safety. So um, summarizing some of the PTSD and AAV diagnostic remission findings um, over, uh, over studies looking at COVID versus IP or COVID versus seeking safety, you know, we're finding higher diagnostic remission rates um, with using the exposure-based um, treatments for PTSD. And then with AUD, um, comparable rates there with about 45, 46% uh, um, in the COPE study, or sorry, in the COPE arm um, meeting, not meeting criteria for AUD as compared to 38% with seeking safety. So summary of part one um, is that PTSD and SUD frequently co-occur. They're associated with a lot of um, really deleterious outcomes, and we need more effective treatments to help address both of them. Um, one, one way to do that is through integrated exposure-based psychotherapy, um, and having a current substance use disorder should not be a barrier to receiving trauma-focused um, care for PTSD. So just to briefly touch on the components of you know, what, what does COVID include, um, PE, as I mentioned, both in vivo and imaginal exposure, CBT for substance use to help patients learn to manage cravings, thoughts about using, and skills to help them reduce or quit use, psychoeducation, and then also the breathing retraining technique to help manage anxiety and cravings. And here's just a table of contents of um, what's included in each of the 12 sessions. And um, I highlighted that in session three is when we begin the in vivo hierarchy um, and in, in vivo exposures in prolonged exposure itself, um, you know, the PE manual, those will start in session two. So it starts one session after. And then in session four is when we initiate the imaginal exposures, uh, which in PE only manual would start in three, um, and then one session later. Early on, we started these much later, but we've moved them up to the front over time. And I think that's had a positive benefit. So as you can see, the imaginal and vivo exposures continue um, throughout the treatment and then are interwoven with relapse prevention um, techniques for SCD, such as awareness of craving, managing cravings, planning for emergencies, refusal skills. Um, we also include awareness and management of anger since it is such a, um, a trigger for relapse and it's a key characteristic of PTSD. So I won't talk too much about prolonged exposure therapy, but there is a really nice PE web online training. Um, if you haven't taken it already, uh, very helpful. The PE is highly effective for PTSD with more than 30 years of empirical research, which is, is why we chose it um, for the integrated intervention. Key components are in vivo exposure, having the patient directly confront fear that safe situations in real life, and then the imaginal exposure, where they're revisiting the memory of the trauma repeatedly during the session. So the rationale, which is really important for patients, um, is that avoidance maintains PTSD symptoms. It's one of the key components of maintaining that. So it helps to normalize those attempts to avoid. It makes sense um, that they, they try to avoid those feelings and thoughts and memories. Um, but asking, you know, has it worked? Is it working? 
Whereas can be very successful in the short term, but in the long term, it can just make it much more. Avoiding by using substances can also um, inflame PTSD symptoms as well. So there's withdrawal symptoms that can mimic hyperarousal symptoms. Substance use can affect mood, cognition, sleep. Um, it decreases the ability of the executive functioning system you know, to, to really help to quiet down the limbic system, which is more amplified and can impact the hypochronic pituitary adrenal stress system um, with chronic use as well. So looking in vivos, um, where they're going into these situations in real life, we're helping them to realize that those avoided situations are safe. I'll just confirm those beliefs. We learn that the anxiety does not last forever, even though they may think it, it dies or it will. Um, just confirm the belief that they won't be able to tolerate the distress. It enhances their self-control, their competence, promotes engagement in positive activities or hobbies or relationships and reduces their isolation. Um, our patients can be very, very isolated. And with PTSD and SUD clients, it helps them learn that they can tolerate these situations and the anxiety and the feelings without using substances. The anxiety goes down over time, just like cravings do, without using. So some of the in vivo exposures, um, which are done in between the therapy sessions, um, are shown here. They're repeated and they're prolonged, so up to 45 minutes, gradual in nature. And it's important to make sure that patients are not using substances before or immediately after that. Walmart is our, our biggest seller, our most common place. I've often joked that like we really should apply for a grant funding from Walmart because we send almost everyone there. And obviously, I will say obviously the in vivo exposures have changed, they've been modified during COVID so that we can make sure that we're being in line with CDC regulations and you know, recommendations to keep people safe, but also helping people go and do those things um, in their real life that they need to do. We look out for safety behaviors as well. These are things that people do or say to temporarily reduce negative feelings or distress. Some of these pictures you know, on the right here, they maintain those negative emotions and they prevent the corrective learning that's so important that patients can handle the situation without the safety behavior. You can think of the substance use as a safety behavior in these situations too. So we work to remove those um, as much as possible. In imaginal exposure, um, we are repeatedly revisiting the trauma in the, in the session for about 30 minutes, followed by 10 or 15 minutes of processing that. It helps to organize the memory, help foster new perspectives on it, um, differentiate then versus now, um, being personal mastery and confidence. They habituate to the anxiety and distress over time and learn that they won't fall apart or go crazy um, and that they can handle it without using substances. So kind of similar to you know, anxiety and craving, um, but there's this wave that, that happens over comes up and it goes down. So it's a natural um, increase and decrease which is so important for patients um, to experience without using substances when it's just increasing. And we have the, um, the SUDS um, and the craving thermometer rated on zero to 100 to help us um, have a common language and talk with patients about you know, where their distress is in that moment, where their craving is in that moment. And also to help patients differentiate, get more, you know, more familiar with the nuances not just a zero to 100, you know, what, what's a 25 like, what's a 40 like, what's a 70 like? So then they can take action, especially when there's you know, building on a craving, and they can do things um, to help minimize that. And Amber uh, Jarnicky, who's in our group, um, looked at the craving and SEDS decreases over time during imaginal um, therapy because we thought that you know, ourselves and some clinicians too might, other clinicians might be interested in what happens to the craving and distress um, for this to a current population where we're doing imaginal exposure. And we found A, that the craving was typically low, um, I think 25, 24, 25 is the highest on a scale of zero to 100. So we found, so that was pretty low and it did decrease over time. Um, in parallel with distress decreasing over time. 
So overview, I'm going to go through this part kind of quickly. Um, overview of the SEU components, normalizing craving, identifying triggers, learning skills to manage those cravings, recognizing and modifying those high risk thoughts, and effective coping skills like drug use, refusal skills. So a lot of the triggers for cravings can be trauma-related triggers, or they could be substance use-related triggers. So things like people, places, and things, negative emotions, thoughts, or physical symptoms um, are all common types of triggers. And again, could be trauma-related emotions, trauma-related thoughts, or substance use related. And one of the key you know, pieces to explain in the integrative therapy is helping them understand why it's important to approach trauma cues but stay away from certain SUV cues. So, you know, approaching the trauma cues um, is safe. It's not dangerous. The trauma is dangerous. Like going to the grocery store or driving your car or going to your doctor's appointment is not objectively dangerous. Um, avoiding substance-related cues um, is done because for those individuals, you know, those cues can be can be dangerous and not safe for them. And just briefly, um, Brian Lozano, who's in our group as well, um, had the idea that we should ask, what are their goals? Do they want to reduce or abstain? And the key finding here is that only about 50% identify abstinence as a treatment goal. And so um, reduced use was usually the treatment goal among younger um, veterans in the sample, those who were employed, the more recent um, conflicts, OEF and OIF, and fewer symptoms of alcohol use disorder. So we talk about how abstinence is the safest option. Um, it's hard to have problems from it if, if you don't use anything. So it's encouraged, but it's not required um, to participate in it. And these are some things that you would want to look at um, to help establish treatment goals, should you work with the patient you know, towards um, abstinence or work with them more towards um, significantly reducing use. So it's a collaborative approach, but you could look at their degree of their substance use disorder, the negative consequences that they've had, um, previous treatments and treatment outcomes, and then family history density as well. And if it's reducing use, uh, being very specific about very specific, specific about the reduction of the amount and frequency, aiming for having some days with no use too, because those are great days to have therapy appointments and do in vivo exercise. And you can revisit it throughout therapy too, that might change. So summary here, focus of trauma focused treatment includes PE. Um, the exposure therapy components start early in section three and they're integrated throughout. SUV components help teach skills to manage cravings, thoughts about using triggers for use, and help reduce users. And again, abstinence is the safest option, but it's not required to receive treatment. The psychoed and the breathing and training are provided. And um, ultimately, it helps patients approach safe but avoided trauma related stimuli without using substances, providing new learning. So, just briefly touching on some of the ongoing studies that we have in future directions. Um, as I mentioned, I'm working with um, Julian Flanagan, and we um, are conducting a study. It's just getting started, looking at COPE plus oxytocin. Um, we're also doing a, a biometric-driven therapist-guided um, study of in vivo exposures that I'll tell you about. The COPE A for adolescents trial is taking place in Australia and going smoothly. And then I'm working with um, several other collaborators on Project Harmony, and I have the website here for Project Harmony. It's being led by uh, Denise Yen and Antonio Morgan Lopez. Uh, Dr. Yen's at Rutgers, and Dr. Morgan Lopez is at RTI. And it's been really exciting pulling data from multiple trials and using um, advanced analytics to look at, um, you know, in a much larger sense, um, effectiveness of different treatments as well as mediators and moderators of outcomes. So just briefly, um, with this study, it's a new coach study with oxytocin. Our target sample size is 180 um, individuals, and we'll be conducting this in a veteran sample, sample as well. Current PTSD and AUD funded through NHPA. So they'll receive oxytocin or placebo prior to each therapy session. 
And um, we'll, we'll also use neuroimaging before and after treatment, um, which we've been doing in most of our trials over the past five or so years. It's 40 IU intranasal dose. So what is oxytocin? Um, probably heard of it. It's a hypothalamic nine amino acid neuropeptide. Um, when we've been talking with patients recently or screening individuals for this, we have to really emphasize this is not, not oxytocin. It's not an opiate by any means, um, oxytocin. Uh, Self-administered intranasally has a short half-life. It's FDA approved for women um, during childbirth. Uh, there's few known contraindications and um, favorable side effect profile. And um, it's being you know, investigated more and more um, in psychiatry uh, for a number of different conditions. Uh, it has pro-social behavioral effects, so increasing trust and social cognition, affect, sharing, empathy, cooperation. These are all factors that are really good um, to have in psychosocial um, treatments. And then with addiction in particular, it's been shown um, to help reduce craving, tolerance, withdrawal, um, and self-administration of ethanol. Um, it's been shown to help reduce corticolimbic connectivity, which is implicated in both alcohol use disorder and PTSD. And a mechanistic study recently showed that it may help reduce um, stress-induced alcohol use by a GAB, uh, GABAergic transmission in the simple nucleus of the amygdala. And plasma oxytocin levels um, have been shown to increase following abstinence in AUD. With PTSD, oxytocin enhances fear extinction, which is one of the key uh, mechanisms ostensibly um, in exposure based treatment. Helps to attenuate the mental reactivity with fear based keys or fear related keys. We had a pilot study that was led by um, Dr. Flanagan, um, showed that oxytocin plus PE is safe and, you know, with the hint of it, more rapidly reducing PTSD symptoms. So we're really excited um, to have started this project and to see if we can augment, you know, the outcomes. And for the neuroimaging component, um, uh, collaborator at NESC, Dr. Jane Joseph, is leading this component. So um, at pre and post treatment, um, individuals who are eligible and interested uh, we'll complete the mirror and then we get a structural scan, resting state scan, and then they complete an fMRI um, task based um, um, protocol. And that involves um, listening to the recordings of personalized imagery scripts for alcohol trauma and mutual events. The, um, we used um, minor adaptations of Dr. Judith Senha's work. To look at or to create those personalized imagery scripts. And then, lastly, I wanted to just share about um, one of our ongoing studies uh, therapist guided biometric driven in vivo exposures. So, in vivo exposures, as we talked about, are patients going out and about into the real world and um, you know, exposing themselves to these distressing but safe situations. And most of the time that occurs totally outside of the purview of the patient. Um, it's on their own for the patient. They usually come back you know, a week later or so and report, you know, how did it go? What was it like? How long did they stay there? Was it effective? But we don't really have objective data about what actually happens. Um, and if something doesn't go well, we often don't hear about it um, until the next session. We can't intervene in that moment. So we are using this technology device for partnering, partnering with um, Zeroscope, which is a uh, telemedicine company locally. And the device uh, has a therapist dashboard that allows um, the therapist to virtually accompany patients when they go on in vivo exposures. There's a dashboard that while the patient is doing their uh, in vivo exposure and the clinician is watching, it provides a real-time streaming of their heart rate, spin conductance, and their SUDS ratings. So you can really see, you know, live in the moment, are they doing it? Are they engaged? Um, and if not, you can intervene to help optimize the exposure. So it helps to enhance accountability, effectiveness, and ultimately, you know, it may help improve outcomes and attrition. And so just to give you an example, this is, uh, an example kind of of what 
you might see it's very it's very basic at this this point very rudimentary we definitely want to um enhance it over time in the development but this is a that dr lozano is doing the therapy here and you can see the patient going through walmart um kind of in an aisle here where there's other people in carts um and we can see their skin conductance moving we can also look at their heart rate and um journaling set which is something that's anxiety leaving for her spending a lot of time there which she might have done the whole time if the therapist had not virtually been there with her to say, okay, let's go to this other aisle. And then the checkout counter is unbelievably, um, it's very, very commonly a source of stress um, and anxiety in patients that are doing the in vivos, which I don't know that we would have really known about um, otherwise. And so in this case, the patient was able to tell the therapist afterwards exactly what she was thinking um, as she was checking out and why it was so distressing. So in summary, um, integrated exposure-based treatment is one option to effectively treat PTSD and SUD simultaneously. Research among men and women, civilian and veterans, patients with multiple types of uh, alcohol and drug use disorders and different types of traumas um, show that this is feasible and safe. Substance use does not increase with trauma work and um, it decreases over time. And so having a current addiction or current SUD shouldn't be a barrier for patients receiving PTSD treatment. The PTSD treatment did not have to be delayed. We definitely need more research um, to address some of the gaps, such as further improving outcomes um, with augmentation, which we're looking at, um, brain stimulation techniques or another type of device or non-pharmacological device that could also um, be helpful. Ways to reduce attrition, avoidance is you know, definitely key in both addiction and PTSD. And so it's a tough group to keep around, uh, but ways, ways to reduce attrition would be really helpful. And then learning more about the mechanisms of action so that we can amplify and improve on those. So we've got some time for questions. Um, I'd be happy to say thank you. Thank you for that great talk. Um, it looks like we had some questions rolling in through the Q&A, so I can read some of those. Looks like we got a couple of minutes. So first question that came up um, is, let's see. So you mentioned that childhood trauma is common among individuals with co-occurring PTSD and substance use disorders. Yeah. What role do you see childhood trauma playing in these co-occurring disorders and what might people keep in mind as they're working with these individuals? Yeah, a great question. Yes, you know, unfortunately, unfortunately, we do see a lot of childhood traumas. And I think, you know, developmentally, um, for traumatic events, you know, that occur in, in certain windows of development, whether it's social and emotional learning, and also development of um, you know, stress response systems, as well could have long term impacts. Um, if, if patients are, you know, as children also growing up in environments where they see substances being used as a way to, to deal with stress or the code, or that's been part of um, the, the trauma experience for them too, then it can make them more susceptible to developing substance use disorders over time. Next question uh, pertains to um, using prolonged exposure or COPE specifically for potentially maybe people in urban settings or environments where the trauma is ongoing or the, maybe the environment isn't necessarily safe or they, maybe they don't consider themselves to have PTSD. Is the approaches that you talked about today, would that be um, advised in those situations? Well, um, you would definitely want to make sure that the environment is safe. And so that's something when the therapist and the patient are building the in vivo hierarchy that has the different in, in vivo um, exercises that they'll do. Um, even though they may feel unsafe to the patient, you want to make sure that objectively they're as safe as they can be. Nothing is 100% safe, of course. Um, so we wouldn't want to you know, we can't guarantee that. However, we can ask questions, you know, about would you, would you have done this before the trauma? 
Um, would you send your mom to this, this store? Um, um, you know, just and, and statistically, like how, how much of a chance is it really that this would be unsafe? So we work with them um, together so that both the patient and the therapist agree like, yes, these are objectively safe situations. If it's not safe um, and you have any concerns about that, then I would definitely not, not do that. We'll do maybe one more. This is an interesting question. The research that you were presenting on augmenting COPE uh, with oxytocin, one individual asked whether medications for opioid use disorder like Suboxone, Naloxone, Methadone, would they interfere or would there be any counterindication for using oxytocin and, and those medications together? Yeah, that is a really good question. And um, not to my knowledge that I could think of, with um, patients who are on like an MAT, you might need to work with them around when they're taking their medication and dosing um, in case there is um, effects of the MAT that could you know, reduce some of their engagement during the in vivos or during the imaginals um, over time. But I would want to follow up probably with a specialist in that area, but I have not heard of at this point any contraindications for oxytocin and um, medication assisted therapies. It's good to know. Do do we have time for one more question? What's uh, what should we, we have do? time for one more? Okay. okay. Last question. It looks uh, so. This is this is also I think a really a question that I I would be interested in hearing your answer to. Um, so thinking about alternate formats for um, COPE, such as um, group-based settings being, or perhaps delivering therapy remotely versus in person, are you collecting any data in terms of efficacy in different formats? Um, do you have any thoughts on whether the efficacy might be reduced in these alternative formats? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, when we do our, like our clinical trials, the pro protocol so, so standard and so um, controlled, but in the real world, um, in terms of dissemination, then I think it, it will be important to look at different formats. And we have talked about, um, for example, at the VA um, that I work at as well, most of the substance use um, treatments, the therapy component is in group. And so we've talked about ways that we might, you know, have a group component that would address is the SUD and maybe some of the psychoed pieces as well together. Um, there might even be ways to, to do some in vivo hierarchy pieces together, but that in an individual therapy session, you would do the imaginal with them. Um, and so, yeah, having that kind of private time for the imaginal therapy sessions and then combined with other pieces in the group therapy session, I do think could have, you know, some positive benefits and, the patients are so isolated sometimes that you know the camaraderie and the sharing that might might take place there could also help them um, get through it as well. We haven't done that yet, but we've certainly been talking a lot about modifying the format of it that way for dissemination. All right, so I think that probably um, exhausts our time. So Sudi, thanks for a wonderful lecture and the Q and A session. It was really tremendously helpful and well done. Thanks, thanks very much. And uh, thanks to uh, Kelly for um, uh, doing, doing the introduction and the Q&A as well. And thanks to the audience. Uh, it's really a great session. And so bye-bye. Uh, thanks. Bye. thanks so much.